Welcome everyone to another online version of the Hustlers Meetup. Um, today I'm very happy to welcome a good colleague of mine, Utku, um, to talk here at the Hustlers Meetup. He'll be talking about linear types. Um, as always, it's great to see so many people joining this meetup. Uh, we're always looking for uh, talks. If uh, anyone is interested in giving a talk about a subject, please let me know. You can reach out to me on the meetup page. Um, yeah, without further ado, uh, welcome, Utku. Thank you very much, much, Andreas. And thank you all for having me here. Um, let me quickly share my screen. So if everyone can see my screen comfortably, I would like to start um, by just mentioning that um, my name is Utku Demir. Um, my GitHub make and Twitter handle and many other stuff is written like this. Um, and I'm a part of Tuigayo. Uh, where I, yeah, where I usually develop Pascal and its stuff. Um, and today I'm going to talk about linear types and linear base. Uh, there is actually, um, there actually was many talks about it, and there was actually one in Jury Hack from Devesh about linear base. Um, and to be honest, I don't have so many things to add on top of those, those folks who are usually by people who are more, much more knowledgeable in this area than me. Um, but what I can do is that um, I can talk about my experience as someone without much of a theory, theory, theory background, right? Um, so what why I am into linear types is that um, while working at Twig, I get to work on linear base for like about one and a half months, I think. And before that, I didn't have any um, anything with linear types extension. And I, I haven't contributed to the extension itself, so I don't know how it is implemented in GHC. I also do not, do not know much about linear logic. Um, so this kind of means that I can get some terminal terminology incorrect. So please uh, forgive me if I do that. And if somebody knows it, please just feel free to point it out. Um, but what I can do is that I can talk about my ex experience of using it and, and what, why I am really excited about it. And, not my understanding of it is. Um, just to, um, I'm not sure if uh, we have many people who is familiar with linear types here, but the first thing I want to do is just to give, show you quickly what it looks like. Um, the linear types extension in DHC is um, just an extra piece of ex information we can declare in our type signatures where um, instead of having instead of using a function error we use one of those linear arrows and that declares how many times we are using that parameter in our function function body and more spec um, it is written like this and the signatures means that if bar is used exactly once then this function is going to use foo exactly once. Um, and we do that by using this percentage, um, percentage one instead of our function arrows. And actually this is a short form of this thing where uh, you specify the multiplicity of fun function error, which is simply as some type, which is either many or one. Um, multiplicity many is just what we are using uh, in Haskell when we use a regular arrow, so you don't um, tend to see this very often. Um, but multiplicity one is common with linear, linear types 
that's why it ha also has this short form of like you can just write one as a numeral and if you like unicode syntax you can use this lollipop uh, like symbol um and linear types uh, proposal went through a few iterations and previously it was using this kind of an arrow with a hash sign and even before that it was using this arrow with a dot sign um, they are not used anymore in GHC but if you look at some old blog posts or, or examples you might see them so yeah you can just remember that this that is the same as the regular linear arrow um, and And one point I would like, I also want to mention is that when when we have a product type or a sum type, using that exactly once means uh, we use all each one of their fields exactly once too. So if you have if you have a tuple that you use exactly once, it means that you have to use both first and second exactly once. And but if when using JDT syntax, we can override this. So we can create a product type where some of the fields should be used exactly once, but some some other fields can be used without restriction. Um, so before this talk, one thing I want to mention is that I would like uh, this talk to be a lot more interactive. So if you have any comments, questions, or, or like correction, or just some remark that you want to make, Please just, just feel, feel free to interrupt me. And I'll take this uh, uh, opportunity to interrupt you. Uh, what was the reasoning uh, from switching from the old syntax with the hash to the new uh, with percentage? Uh, do you know? Uh, it looks a bit less readable from the first impression I have. Yeah, I... Like I the, the, read, sorry, read this comment from the proposal um it was a pretty recent change mm -hmm. um but i yeah i do not really remember reasoning but i can find out the comment and post it to slack after this talk thank you appreciate it um yeah and if, if, if anyone else knows the answer i'm happy if you answer that too Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if that might be because of the hash operator sometimes having a special meaning in Haskell. Yeah. Well, it's because of magic hash, that is? Possible. And, and overloaded labels. Oh, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Oh, I, I will find the comment and post it to Slack. Thank you. Um, yeah, this it is simply what this extension does. So like from surface, surface to me, it looks pretty intuitive. And, but I like as far as, as, far as I heard from people who actually implemented, it has a lot of intricacies about how it is implemented in GHC. Um, but yeah, from, from a user's perspective, it is as simple as a function uses uh, a value exactly once in its definition. Um, so the simplest uh, use of linear types, I think, is enforcing conservation of a value. So for example, when we are writing a reverse function, if we, if we declare that that function uses its parameter linearly, that restricts uh, what this function can do uh, quite a bit because this means that it can only use those each one of those a's exactly once in the output um, it means that it cannot forget any of the a's it cannot uh, use an a twice so in the end what it essentially means is that the output array will can only be a permutation of the input array so there is nothing much this reverse function can do other than reordering the input and like even this is uh, 
pretty useful, I would say, because um, because that is something you uh, one could easily use on their code base um, without doing much refactor. And as you can see, um, the code looks pretty much like usual Haskell. Um, but in order to get this example work, we need this import. The main reason is that in the reverse functions implementation, we are using this plus plus operator. So if this was plus plus operator from prelude, um, it wouldn't have any information about how it uses their parameters. So, um, so then the type checker will complain to us saying, saying that like you, you were claiming that you were using this x, x and x s exactly once, but then you are passing it to a function which can do anything, anything with them. So it is not going to be happy. That's why we, um, we also developed a standard library called linear base, where one of the points of it is to come with, um, come with re-implementations or usual just casts of base functions where we also attach linearity in information. So this function from linear, linear base says that in order to, in order to cre create the resulting A, it uses the in input parameters exactly once. That's why we can use it when writing up linear functions. Um, a much more developed version of uh, this idea is also informative blog post with better commentary. And yeah, you can find it from, from this link. I'll send, share the slides in the channel. And like what it basically does is that it implements the whole merge sort using this one. So it is statically ensured that the output list is a permutation of the input list. Um, yeah, so that, that is the simplest benefit we can gain from using linear types in our code base. Um, um, can question. Also... Uh, is there a reason that the default prelude can be changed to have all linear annotations? Um, uh, or is there some incompatibility there? It is a, it's a really, really good question. So linear arrow is just a subtype. I, so probably subtype is not the correct word here, but that's the one I can think of. Subtype also regular arrow, right? So if a function uses its parameter only once, it means it can also, it's a subset of functions which can use their parameter however they want. Um, the main, I think the main reason behind that was that uh, that would be a pretty drastic change to base, which is used by um, everybody who uses Haskell. So having linear arrows there might uh, might make it harder uh, to the uh, newcomers or making it harder to develop. And it's probably uh, very courageous to just change all of the type signatures of the base because of a new language extension. But I don't see if there is a, I don't know if there is a technical way that we cannot do that. And I guess it could still be done later on once linear types have settled. Yes, yes, definitely. And um, yeah. yes, so like one thing, um, we are, so currently uh, there is also some work on making Haddock play well with linear types. And there one of our concerns is that um, we don't want to show linear arrows everywhere. Um, so yeah, if, if we find a set, satisfying, if people can find a satisfying solution to that, we, and if like the ecosystem is happy with it, we can move clearly to use that. Um, yeah, there, there is also a few cases where uh, a linear version of a function does is implemented slightly differently than the nonlinear function because there's something you 
uh, for example, the simplest case is that the end, the linear end, actually evaluates both of the Boolean arguments even when the first one is false. So it doesn't short, short circuit uh, because it has to consume the second argument exactly once too. So there are some nuances like that that be, they behave slightly differently. Um, Hope that was useful. And yeah, like, and we can develop this idea a bit further um, by things, by creating an interface which enforces that um, that we hold only a single reference to a certain value. So um, I think one early misconception I had about linear types is that I kind of assume that just by having a value uh, it linearly, it would ensure that no one else has access to the, the value. That is uh, not the case. As I said before, it simply mean, simply just describes how my how a single function uses that value. But there are some things we can do to provide safer interfaces. So one of the patterns we use in linear base is this one um, where when we are creating a value uh, instead of returning it directly we expect a lin we ask for a linear continuation and in that continuation you can only pass linear functions we can implement it we can use this fact by um, in in this example where Let's say we are implementing an application where we where we are modeling like a money transaction, right? So we have some pool of money that we want to do some operations for, but like maybe we'll allocate some of them to some people and they will transfer them between each other. But in them, the invariant we want to set hold is that we want to ensure is that um, we don't use the money we don't have. So if, so we don't want to be in a case where when we are implementing the transfer function, we forgot to subtract the money from one account before adding it to the another one so that we end up using more money than we have. So we can use linear types to ensure that an amount of money is used exactly once which means that you cannot destroy money without explicit asking maybe, or you cannot use the money to do two different things. And which is actually how it works, right? If I have a hundred dollar bill and if I split this to have like two fifty dollar bills, I cannot use the original hundred dollar bill, bill anymore. And vice versa, like when I'm combining those fifty dollar bills, then they are gone, they are used and the only thing relevant is the new hundred dollar bill. Um, so we can model this as this one. Um, so when, when we are adding two currencies together, we can say that this operation uses the parameters exactly once. And we, when we are splitting it, we can also ensure that it uses the original currency exactly once to um, in the process of creating the split versions. And then the, when we implement our program in terms of those combinators, it is statically ensured that um, we always use only the amount of money that we have, we had initially, which is, uh, which is again, quite an easy gain. Um, I, I, I'm sure probably most of you now are thinking about um, like type level, type level naturals and like index monads and you can implement something like session types to um, encode this in the type system. But this is 
like this is pretty simple um, and I'm not sure if the GHC type level naturals will be as strong as as expressible as those ones um, so yeah another thing I would like to point out here is that this function this amount function simply accesses the amount of money instead of inside a currency but uh, different than the usual accessors here it also returns the currency itself as a as a value this is also a pattern in common in linear types because if this function were to consume the currency uh, it wouldn't be very useful because as soon as you check the amount stored inside the value then you would lose access to it so that's not desirable so even the read-only function return a new instance of the currency that um, that ensures that there is only as I think it's called a single traded use that um, all of your operations consume the currency and give you a new one so you are ensured that there is only one of them valid at any given time um, yeah this is as i said before this is just a development of um of this idea and there is a better explanation in this blog post if someone writes something in the chat let me check. i have a i have a question sure um with that interface it, mm -hmm. it i mean it looks it looks like we'd never sort of be able to call with. I mean, because I don't, all of your linear functions mm -hmm. return more currency. There's nothing that, that sort of consumes it in the end. Oh, yes, that is a good point. I mean, I, 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 like I understand you could have like a spend function or something that, that does, mm -hmm. and that, that wouldn't be hard to add. But I just, do you, do you agree with, with, uh, with that? Yes, I do agree. Okay. Um, actually, that was a recent change uh, I did because originally in this code, that function was also that return will be also containing currency. But you are right. Um, you you should have a span way to span the currency in order for this to type check. You are exactly right. I have one more question uh, with regards to general linear types. <clears throat> it forces you to use the ver the argument once. So, for example, in a function amount, you are forced to return also currency as well, mm -hmm. right? Uh, normally, without linear types, we don't have to return currency, and that gives us a guarantee that currency itself is not going to be modified because it's a pure function. Now. Uh, what gives us a guarantee that the return currency hasn't changed, right? We could uh, add something to that, uh, to the return value, and uh, uh, we don't get this purity uh, guarantee that uh, the, the argument hasn't changed when we return it. Does it make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. It's a good point. I, that it's a point that I haven't considered before. Yes, now the amount now the amount also looks like it can change the input currency. Mm -hmm. um, let me think for a second. Yeah, so <laughs> it's a bit weird in the sense in this deal about referential transparency and, and linear types, right? Mm -hmm. you, you can see that um, it looks like this is changing the currency but essentially what's happening is that this doesn't exist uh, after this function is called um, yeah, yeah I, I get that part right I, have, I know that the original is not going to change so original can stay the same uh, but we, we can no longer use it because it has been used already by the function amount so mm -hmm. the only way we can guarantee that it, uh, it doesn't change if, if it's not linear Yes, yes, you are you are right that we lose um, we lose that here. That 
technically I could implement a multi in the sense that it changes the original currency too. Anyways, I don't want to derail the, the conversation, so can I please continue. I'll, I'll, I wanna, I'll think about it myself more. Like, that is a great question. Like, I haven't considered mm -hmm. that too, so thank you. Um, yeah, like, uh, actually, uh, relevant. Something I was thinking, when we are implementing linear types, um, we have some read-only operations that return currency just um, just because of the linear trading, and we have other operations that actually modifies that. So if we had a way to distinguish them, then we can implement some some machinery around it. Like we can, we can implement things like Rust copy on write copy on write pointers, where only modifying a currency copies it. Otherwise, you, your read-only operations use the same value. Um, I don't think we have something like that, but it, I believe that should be implementable. It should be possible to implement this on a library level. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Um, again, like this idea is much more more developed on a few of Twix's blog posts where you can use linear types to encode state transitions in types where I think in this example, it talks about the network sockets where like when you are doing socket programming, I don't remember the exact order, but you have to create the socket, bind it to some address, start listening from it and start ex accept calls from it and then once you accept the call, you can send and receive data. Um, but the thing is that turn to the listen function takes a so when you call call the listen function, it doesn't ensure that you cannot use the previous socket. So you might um, so yeah. One once you do that, you might end up having a bug in your code. So by using linear types, you can ensure that um, the operations happen exactly in the order you specify and you cannot access the previous uh, state. That is actually a pretty uh, nice benefit of linear types that we see in a few more examples where if we have something like a state machine with linear types, we can ensure that the previous state is uh, not used after the transition. Um, I think something similar to this note is that we also have a fork of streaming library where, you know, in streaming libraries, you have the state and you get, an, you get a value, you apply to the state and that gives you a new state of the code that you can apply another value. The thing is that not one, when you do that, you have to make sure that you don't use the previous state again uh, because those things are effectful and its behavior is not defined when you do that. So we also have, an ex have a piece of code when with linear types, we ensure that that cannot happen. Um, also, this one, the second post, making two garbage collectors be good neighbors is uh, one of the initial uses of linear types, I think, in inline Java, um, where when managing Java references in Haskell, you have to you want to make sure that it's it's free at one point, and after it's free, uh, the value is not used. So linear types can exp make it safer. Other than it, yeah, can make it safer. Um, so, as in previous example, um, linear types provides us to enforce uniqueness of, of values. And by uniqueness, I mean that when a function has a linearly linear value, it can ensure that it holds the only reference to that value. That lets us kind of sidestep the referential transparency issues 
um, by just ensuring that there is no other references. And we use this trick to implement things like mutable collections, where, um, where we have a collection type, like in this example, it's a hash map that we use linearly. And our API ensures that uh, all the operations return a new hash map and you cannot um, create two references to the, to the same hash map without doing, the, doing a copy. So with an interface like that, um, we can implement this pure looking hash map, but in the, uh, in the back, in the bank, it is actually modifying a, like a memory block with in place updates. Um, so we have quite a bit of collections about that. Like I think we have unlisted and listed arrays, vectors and hash maps and sets in linear base. And all of them is implemented in terms of unlisted arrays, I think in the back. Um, and this is one of the, um, yeah, like you, which is one of the use cases where the benefit is easily seen because yeah, alternatively, either we would use, um, either we would use immutable collections or, um, or we would use a monad like ST where we can do mutable Mutable, mutable updates inside, um, but that would make our our code like look stateful, and there's certain things you cannot do inside the C, inside an ST. Like in in this function, that hash map is pretty much an ordinary value, right? You can pass it to separate threads, uh, like store it inside records, and just use it as an ordinary uh, immutable looking pure value. Um, but then it will do what you expect. Um, are are these uh, hash map the, these mutable operations? Are these implemented with like some new linearly typed uh, array primitives? Um, yes. So in uh, in linear base, there is uh, unlisted arrays, which are implemented in terms of the mutable array type, like primitive from GHC X, X. And from that we implement listed arrays and from that we implement hash maps. Um, and yeah, these hash maps are our um, new implementations, not using anything else. Um, but we could do that. So like instead of implementing uh, implementing hash maps from arrays, you could find a mutable hash map library from um, from package and just write a linear wrapper on top of that, which ensures that you know, there's no references and you do like the unsafe perform while and a mutable operation inside. So that would be one way to implement it, but this is um, safer because by construction, you know that it, it, um, the, yeah, like by construction, you know that it doesn't have the referential transparency issues. Mm. Yeah, by the way, I also have the linear based source code open so somewhere. So if you want to see if, how something is implemented, we can just go check it out. Um, yeah, so um, as I mentioned a few times, using linear types um, usually um, requires using um, like linear functions all the way down. But uh, as we talked before, base doesn't have this linear in linearity information where and that's where linear base comes in. Um, so it, it is some parts of it is re-implementations or wrappers around base where the functions have the line, linearity information attached. Um, 
but unfortunately it has to implement a lot of things uh, from scratch and probably the thing which is most which was most surprising to me is that it has to implement the most of the types type plus hierarchy like a functional hierarchy from scratch too because yeah when you think about it our fmap function um, has un unrestricted arrows and that ends up being not usable in linear functions and i'm sure you saw this uh, this blog post and talk from our know where um, the function hierarchy for example is pretty different because depends on which arrows on the function on the fmap function that you make linear uh, you end up with different type of functors so you in that talk you have data functors and control functors and like if you haven't i would suggest that's like a pretty fun read and that's probably the best post about linear types um, so yeah in linear base there is two functor hierarchies one of them is control functors and one of them is data functors and i think we put traversable on top we also have a numeric hierarchy where the operations uh, are linear, same with monoids and semi groups. So, yes, pretty much a whole new world. Um, on top of the re implementation of the base, base, we also provide some new utilities for working with linear, linear values. I guess the most used one is this unrestricted one that we saw on the previous code too uh, where um, as, as i told as i said initially the as i said initially if a sum type if a product type is used linearly all of its constituents like all of its fields should only use exactly one but sometimes you don't want that like sometimes when you Want to return a tuple where a value is linear, but you also want to return some unrestricted, unrestricted thing, right? Like in HashMap example, the hash map should be threaded linearly, but there is no, there is no reason that you couldn't use like a field inside HashMap more than once. That's what where we use unrestricted, uh, which lets us like escape. I'm not sure if escape is the correct word, word but escape unrestricted unrestricted values inside linear context context so this one is pretty widely used um, we also have consumable um, which is a bit similar to what um, Richard asked about consume uh, spending the money um, where sometimes when you have a linear value you want to ensure that it's not going to be used multiple times but it's fine if we forget about it so consumable lets you express that where if a value is consum consumable at any point you can use consume and that would free the value or like yeah like you can lose the reference into it um, same with dupable where there are some values that you can copy and clone that can be implemented using um, dupable And this is, they are actually pretty widely used in linear base where, for example, in operations like take while, where if, where if you, if you only cons return a part of the list, you have to do something with the rest of the list, right? So you have to consume the elements after that. So that's where the consumable instance is used. And on the same type take while function, you actually use the, uh, all elements multiple times first you check it against a predicate and then you put it into a put it into the resulting list so that's that's where you need a dupable instance where it does where it copies that checks the predicate with one copy and puts the other copy um, to the re resulting list um, is that and after this, 
linear based kind of becomes cool things to be implemented using linear types. Um, so we have the pure collections with in place updates. We also have allocation free array pipelines, um, which which means that think of like I, I think of this um, something like um, rep, something like Vepa or Massive where you can do multiple operations in multiple operations for an array and instead of all of the operations create a new array they fuse and you can explicitly force it to be allocated allocated which would cause all the intermediate computations will be to be performed so linear linear types can make it safer by ensuring that those computations can happen happen once um, we uh, have so a uh, to, to linear types replace some uh, like the, the GHC has these fusion uh, operations uh, do linear types replace some of those or make them more reliable? Um, um, or like, like so the, like, yeah, the, the replace rules or what they're called? So um, one point of linear types is that it can, so the, the issue with fusion is that it's, um, it's not explicit. So it's hard to get it right. Like you can have, you can have a set of operations that fuse at one point, but then a minor modification in somewhere might make it break. Uh, linear types allows us to provide, allows providing an API where this fusion is explicit. Um, so that is one of the points of um, destination arrays in linear, linear types and more with push and pull arrays. And yes, as you said, that definitely um, is an alternative to GHC's uh, fusion and like rewrite rules. Yeah, but uh, I guess they, uh, they won't make standard Haskell code. Uh, like linear times can't make standard Hask Haskell code fast because it has to be explicit for to be to do mm. that. Um, but, uh, 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 I like nothing. I can only say that not in its current state. But um, the question is a bit uh, over my league, and probably people who know know about DHC more can answer this better by like whether that DHC can exploit this linearity information to have some guarantees. Or if it is doable or not, but uh, that's not something I can answer. Sorry. Yeah. Cool. Um. Um. Yes. Yeah, so, like as you can see in this slide, there's like a, a lot of new and exciting abstractions in linear base with like very varying levels of maturity. Um, most of them are like either performance focused or safety focused. Um, but yeah, like when, when you are using them, you should kind of expect them missing some functions or missing some utilities or maybe not being as fast as the counterparts because um, like, yeah, there is just no one else used them. <laughs> So not many people have used them before. So yeah, expect some bugs or performance issues. Um, but yeah, most of them are like, actually I can say that almost all of them are really easy to write. Uh, so really easy to read. So feel free to like open linear based code and see how they're implemented. Uh, that is, yeah, like that would give plenty of examples about how linear types is used. Um, so I always talked about the advantages, but there are some considerable uh, 
uh, disadvantages too, where we have the, the missing ecosystem. So that is something we are working towards fixing by linear base, but it's definitely not compete with everything in Hackage. So that's a big limitation using the linear types. The error messages are not extremely helpful. Um, it like my issue with them is that it you currently tell whether whether a variable is used so which variable is used multiple times, but it doesn't know where is it used. So you have to kind of figure out the occurrences of the variable and see if they are all linear. Um, another thing is that usually when you are having working on linear functions, you also work on linear values. You also work on a lot of unrestric unrestricted values. And sometimes you have to use other functions for working on unrestricted values. This is pretty rare because usually if, if you have a linear function, you can also pass unrestricted values to it. Uh, but yeah, you once in a while require, you require it. So that might force you to import linear prelude and import ordinary prelude qualified and things like that, which is not pleasant. Um, there are still some Haskell structures which cannot be used with linear values. Uh, the most important time are let and case bindings. The, like the things you bind with let is always used many times. The same with the thing you synchronize with case, which is also used many times. Um, there is an easy workaround for that. You can simply use anonymous functions with uh, like ampersand operator, which looks pretty similar. And th there are work to change the disordering of case. Not work. Like there is a suggestion suggestion to change the desugaring of case so they work uh, in linear context. And usually the Haskell extensions like view patterns and much more, they don't tend to work well with linear types. Um, and to me, this is not extremely important because type inference only infers on type inference only infers on restricted arrows. So it looks uh, pretty major and it probably is, but to me, I didn't see, see this as a big issue, um, mainly because it is uh, predictable. So you know what type inference will fail to infer pretty easily. So you can work around that. So you don't tend to get, like when you get a type error, you know what, why is it, why does it happen? So that's not, uh, so that doesn't bother me a lot. Yeah, so um, I'm getting the end of the presentation. Um, so if, uh, so it's not, this is not the most enlightening presentation, but what I wanted to convey is that it is simple and intuitive to use once you start using it. Um, so before linear type proposal, there was, there was this, um, Everybody was complaining, like some people were complaining that linear types would be a lot complex, but I like, I, I'm very happy to see that the result doesn't feel complex to use. Like to me, it is simple and intuitive and it will only get better as more people use it and it is further developed and the kinks that I mentioned in the last slide will be ironed out and I believe that opens up a lot of possibilities that we probably haven't thought about them. So yeah, I'm looking forward to see what people will come up with. And as last, if, if you want to use it, it is landed in GHC head and it will be released uh, soon in GHC 9. Like I think GHC 9 is supposed to be released uh, by now. So. Yeah, so it's a bit late, but it also means that it will be soon. But you can use it from NixPKGS, where GHC, where there are two attributes which point to GHC with linear types. And linear base, and if you want to look, read more about it, linear base is readme 
has a lot of links to a lot of resources that might be useful. Um, yeah, that is pretty much what what I planned to talk about today. So if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer. Uh, I guess I have a uh, question about the consumable uh, mm -hmm. type. Um, mm -hmm. That I mean that the standard uh, hashtag, um, yeah, hashtag one annotation probably means exactly you can you have to use it exactly once. Mm -hmm. uh, but the consumable one seemed to me like it's it says uh, at most once you can use it at most yes. once or or zero times. Yes, exactly. Um, so that, yeah. So uh, it it is a slightly different than saying that it can be used at most once because it's you still have to use one once and the de allocation is not the correct word but like consuming it will be explicit. Uh, if it was uh, at most once, then you could just ignore it. So, right. Yeah. Uh, where was it? Yeah, so I have an example here. So if we um, currently, if we say if we don't use X, it will complain that we haven't used X exactly one time. But we could use A and something like this one, like consume X and return an empty list, then it would be happy. I will be happy. Oh yes, the prisoners. Is there a plan to add a zero, for example, like for function like proxy that don't consume a type at all? I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, uh, like I, I haven't, I definitely haven't heard of it, mm -hmm. but there might be. It's also kind of uh, interesting to see like the consumable that implements something like uh, zero or one occurrences. Uh, you, you can apparently implement something like that using a library function. Um, so I'm now thinking if it's possible to implement a, an exactly zero type uh, using a library function as well, though, though it might need some extra, uh, some extra like for LSEC there. To, mm -hmm. to explicitly discard the things. Yes, def definitely it sounds possible. I don't know what would happen with zero, but like for example, we have something, we also have an implementation of length index vectors in linear base in here as a V type. Um, this means that we, this means that you can express having exactly five of something. Uh, so that can also something which can be implemented in library level. So yeah, so therefore not having something can also sounds easy to implement. It's also a, a seems to have a lot of um, like the use cases seem to maybe overlap with uh, dependent types a bit, like the. The length indexed vector is is usually like the the, the example dependently typed languages use to demonstrate themselves. Um, although I guess this can be implemented already with even without linear types. Uh, yes, definitely. Like the length index vector implementing does not use linear types extension at all. Let oh. me check. Yeah, <laughs> actually. Oh, okay, so there, it is using it somewhere. <laughs> um, right, but I, yeah, I guess but, it's, uh, it's... Yeah, I don't think it's using it on like any fancy type of arithmetic test. Right, that's right so, so it's... It's... it's uh, are, are there... Do you think there are use cases of that... of dependent types and, and linear types that overlap? Um, it's like... <laughs> So, Richard Eisenberg is on this call, so I'm not going to talk much about <laughs> dependent types. 
uh, but uh, like there are some overlaps in the sense that for example you can this reverse function ensures that the input list and the output list has the same number of elements so right if yeah. you wouldn't have dependent types you could probably do the same with length index vectors and anything more complex than that would require type level arithmetic and maybe dependent types um, but yeah like I, I would say that there are some there are some use cases where you might use linear types but I think it would be a very very tiny space in the huge space of dependent types yeah yeah For, for for what it's worth, I, I agree with everything Angu just said. Um, and and in particular, you know, well, I was thinking actually when you asked the question, uh, no, I think linear types and dependent types sort of achieve different things. But this is, you're absolutely right, reverse, you can prove that it's a permutation either through linear types or through dependent types. And I think the linear types way is better because it's simpler. And it's much easier to, to write reverse. If you use the length index vector to write reverse, it's really quite painful. And it, it either requires a quadratic time algorithm, which, which actually this, this is. Um, yes. but it this, could is not be the, this is not really the way to write reverse. Actually, that'd be interesting. Can you, can you write reverse the efficient way with linear types easily? I assume you can. Um, yeah, so let, let's check. <laughs> Um, because you can't with dependent types without sort of twisting around backwards. It's it's oh, really yeah. quite painful. You can write it easily by just unsafe casting the prelude well. function. Um, so just like ignore, for, forget you see that. So that, but yeah, I, I can try it. Like I can try writing a efficient reverse reverse with linear types. Can you use the dlist style append using functions to get the cheap append at the end with linear types? Would that immediately be a solution or is that something where you would have to think, oh, I don't know if it's possible or not immediately? I do not know what is meant by dlist type appends, but if someone else can answer, I happy to listen. Yeah, I can I can link it. It's the it's the approach where you just represent a list as uh, as a function, where at the very end then you like apply the empty list to it. But uh, hmm. I will I will link it, which makes it a little bit clearer, and then maybe you can uh, you can tell us whether uh, linear types could immediately, or let's say linear base already can express that, because then I would imagine that that it would be possible. Oh sure, yeah, I link it in you, a moment in you, the chat. If you send a link, I I can take a look and answer it. One thing I wanted to mention about this reverse function is that the dependent type reverse function will, might be useful in more cases because it will, then you would have the type level proof that those lists have the same length and you could like combine the, those proofs with um, other utilities. So in, in when looking at reverse in, with linear types, we know that they, they have the same elements, but I'm not sure if we can, like, GHC can do a lot with that information. Yes, I guess that's true. I agree with that. So dependent types can, should be used, you know, in which way? Instead of a percent one, it should be a percent n polymorphic, right? And then n should be supplied as a value, right? <laughs> <laughs> then brought to the type and then I, I, it was it was a joke I'm, I'm okay, like, hey. okay. <laughs> <laughs> i mean that's, that's not being serious to, to if like deep, you could somehow have dependent types which implement linear types yeah <laughs> Maybe. Uh, that's interesting yeah the, the, we were thinking about that like probably Linear, something like linear types can be implemented by something like index monads where um, 
where the fact that you use something or not would be stored at the type level and every operation will modify that information. Um, but it would definitely won't look as simple as this. Um, I guess unless you have some syntactic sugar by GHC, which transforms it into some, although you, like in the, with dependent types, you probably have some proof as output or something and probably can't have syntactic sugar for that. Um, so maybe not. Yeah. Like again, talking about dependent types is pretty much out of my league because I, as I said, I, I, I don't know, I don't know about neither the linear logic or dependent types enough to see if there is like the straightforward connection between them. I imagine it would be hard. Um, I have not, I've not thought about that, but my, my tendency is to, is to say that it's probably not a good idea because I know there's quite a lot of steam coming out of a bunch of clever people's ears about combining dependent types and linear types over the past couple of years. And so if you could encode one in the other, I imagine that would have come out of that work at, by now. Um, that's a really weak argument. I mean, sometimes there's a lot of good ideas that just get missed. Um, so I, I, I don't want to put a lot of weight in that, but um, there's a whole line of papers on what's called quantitative type theory or also graded dependent type theory um, as sort of the same thing in a sense that combines dependent types with linear types. Um, and in fact, Idris too is based on and I think Agda too, they're working on it as well, um, is based on this, it's called quantitative type theory. Yeah, um, Idris is actually the thing that uh, came to mind as well. Uh, you, you mentioned this example about uh, sockets, uh, making sure that sockets uh, can be used multiple times. Um, and Idris also has like, Idris one at least had this as an example uh, of where dependent types could be used, uh, which then ensure the socket gets like, um, yeah, it also ensures something about uh, sockets being transitioned and, and you can, you're not being able to send data to socket that hasn't been opened, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, that makes sense. Like, uh, uh, I, I'm sure those state transitions can also be expressed by linear types. Like if your states are, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, like it, this is the post we were talking about. It expresses sockets. Oh, I think there's linear implementations here. Yeah, and like this syntax and this argument combination has changed quite a bit, so it's going to post a bit out of state, but the idea should be the same. Right, any more questions or comments? Um, thank you, great presentation. Yeah, if we have no further questions, then. Thanks a lot for the great presentation. Um, thanks, Ukut. And thank you everyone for joining and for the great discussion.